whether you're studying for your ham radio license or or for a Magento <laughs> test, you take a practice test a bazillion times, you're not going to, it's not going, and you memorize all the answers. Right. If the test, if the practice test is legit, i.e. not a carbon copy of the real test, right? You're, it's not going to help you study. <laughs> Joseph, how you doing, sir? Hey, it's awesome to be here. I love what you guys do, and it's uh, thanks for having me on. Yeah, man, I, I love all the stuff you're putting out, um, and uh, it's good to get a chance to chat. Did we we did a podcast a while ago, right? I'm trying to remember. I can't remember if we did one or not a few right. years back. Maybe not. Yeah, I, I don't while. remember doing that, but my it's been a while too, so I don't, <laughs> couldn't, couldn't say for sure. I would have to check the archives because I went back and I, I've done sort of had periods where I've done chunks of interviews and stuff. And I went back and was like, oh, mm -hmm. my gosh, that stuff was a while ago. So, um, oh, yeah. But uh, anyways, how are you doing in the in the time of covid during the pandemic, all this stuff? How are you staying sane? Hopefully you're staying sane. And if so, yes. you know, how what are you doing to kind of stay sane so far? Well, it's it's funny for me. I work from home, right? So it's, I, my heart goes out to the people that has, have been especially affected with their job. Um, whether the transition from work, work in the office to work from home for some people, that's been a great transition. Other people hasn't for me, it's been just about as unimpactful as you could possibly imagine. So working mm -hmm. from home, um, yeah, we go on walks, try to haven't been doing too well with that. My family go on, we go on walks, get the kiddos exercise. I mean, honestly, not much has changed uh, gotcha. in that way. I work, I, I get outside occasionally, you know, that sort of thing. But otherwise, it's been very minor. So um, I'm blessed to still have a job, blessed to still be able to work with our merchants. And I, I have I have absolutely no complaints. That's cool, man. Yeah, I think that's definitely, you know, people fall into a few different buckets. You know, some people, right. life has really changed quite a bit and yeah, they're yeah. they're having a hard time. Other people, it's, especially if you've already been working from home and are used to it, mm -hmm. um, it's, there's a learning curve to working uh, remotely and yes. uh, working from home specifically. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily trivial. A lot of people think like, oh, whatever, it's work from home, but you know, you kind of like, do you have your own dedicated space and stuff like that? Like, yes, like an office? yes. I, yeah. down in the basement here, I mean, it's pretty wide open. So occasionally the kids will come down and crash the party occasionally. And on um, that, you know, always gives them a few extra smiles, but, uh, yeah, otherwise it's, it's usually pretty quiet down here. And, and I totally agree. Having that dedicated space is so important. And mm -hmm. for me, it's nice because then I just, you know, get the studio set up occasionally record some videos and then get back to work. Uh, you've so, been hit yeah you've been hitting the videos hard man i love it you got a great setup uh i seen um a number of your clips very very well done um how's that going for you the youtube thing all that stuff it's it's good uh and i hate to say it but i haven't been spending as much time in the last month or so as i should have we actually moved um and so it seems like after that my priorities have shifted we had our work slowed down for just a little bit our working with merchants that slowed down and i was able to dedicate more time to it now that's picked back up so i've been able to not spend as much time but uh, it's been i i love the video stuff because um i'm able to you know if i pick up a tip on slack or uh while focusing on specific certifications or with the whole adobe uh migration of magento certifications into the adobe you know trying to be out there and, and helping as much as possible uh you know uh clear the air as far as what's happening uh in that department so it's been great um uh if nothing else just learning experience i love it i mean there's trying to get a video setup going as you as you well know i mean it's there's a lot to it and making it look good. Yeah. And yours looks great. So, you know, you, you figured it out and it's just, but I, I've observed, like, I love, I've, I love watching your videos through the course of time. Like you started out, it looked good and now it looks great. I mean, it's, it's a process. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's uh, an iterative. It's a very iterative that's right. process. Yeah. The yeah. thumbnails, there's, there's so many things. Yep. Ha half of the time I feel like this is really cool. This is going great. And half of the time I'm like, 
you're an idiot. What are you doing? <laughs> it's very, it's very easy to yeah. judge yourself very harshly, uh, mm -hmm. it, it, just in general, but specifically with video and, and, and putting yourself online oh, and yeah. stuff. It's, there's something about it. It's I, I like five times a day. I'm like, you're stupid. You're ugly. You're bad at it. You know, it's oh, just all on. those. <laughs> all those yeah. Thoughts. I'm just being honest. I, I hate watching know? my own videos. Yeah. I hate watching my own videos, but yeah, yeah I'm sure you're the same way. It's just, um, but you know, people are still subscribing to the channel and, um, you know, it's people say that they find the videos helpful and that's, that's, yeah. that's my number one goal. Honestly, it's just, is to be able to help people. There's so much uncertainty. Okay, I'm going to go take this certification. What am I expecting? What's what's going to await me in this process? And obviously, I cannot and will not give away the questions and the answers, right? But, but there's a whole bunch around that testing, like how to prepare for it and how to, uh, how to take the test, et cetera, that my goal is just to put people at ease. Okay, you can do this. The big thing is just to make sure you study it enough. Yeah. So you've really carved out a niche, a beautiful niche for yourself around obviously certification prep and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. We were talking about that a little beforehand. So many agencies are so busy with the day to day putting out fires that they never get a chance mm -hmm. to really create a product or like a focus niche. And I think you've done uh, an incredible job with that. And you, you're, you're starting Thank to you. talk a little bit about some of the motivation behind that. But what was like your motivation or thinking behind really going into this niche and uh, attacking it as as heavily as you have? Well, it's funny you ask that, Kalen, because I don't think I had a motivation going into that. I probably should have. I should have, you know, worked out a, a whole business plan and all that stuff. But but it, it started back in I think it was wasn't it twenty August of twenty seventeen when the then solution specialist, now business practice practitioner. Uh, test came out version one and for Magento two and the first edition of that test. And uh, I thought, Hey, when I go to sit for these tests, my goal is to, uh, be obviously ready to take the test. And so I, I, I wrote these study guides, um, for myself. And that was for all the M one tests that I took and then starting on the M two. And I was like, you know, there was some information about M one certs, but there wasn't a huge amount. And that's why I still built my uh, my study guide just for every one of them. I, I wish I sh could drum one, them up somewhere. And so I thought, well, hey, what if I put this out in the same format and I'll just dress it up a little bit. It's, it's not, it's going to look decent and I'll, I'll share it with people. And to be frank, that is a solution specialist. It turned out, people loved it. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, all I ask is that somebody give me their email address in exchange for that. The first year, I did that. I mean, I, it was probably, it was hundreds and hundreds of hours, uh, invested in those study guides as well as a practice test. Um, and my goal was to, to help people. And it, it really did. Uh, it for a lot of people has made the difference between passing and failure. Yeah. Yeah. So you kind of just were scratching your own itch, put it out there. Mm -hmm. And, and then you were like, Oh my God, people are really, there's a real neat desire yes. for this. And then it just mm -hmm. kind of snowballed and you just kept, yes. kept going from there. Yes, exactly. And, and, and nice. the practice tests were along the same line. And that was, I think it was 2018 that I sat down and started building out with uh, just plain old vanilla JavaScript, uh, the whole practice test side of that. And since then we've rebuilt it as the PWA in view, but uh, it was, that's, so not only to have to write the practice test, call it engine, but then it was writing all the questions to go with it. So that was kind of, it was an iterative process along in that way too. But actually, no, I take that back. I started with a, uh, was it called a Google form? I think, right. The, the you have Google form is like a survey. That's, I mm -hmm. think I started with that, um, on, on those pages. Again, it was free and, uh, the questions were not ideal at all, but hey, they got, they, they worked and, and it give, gave people confidence and it showed me this was something that people found helpful. Yeah. Yeah. People, uh, the certification process is, is difficult. I've only ever gotten one <laughs> certification myself, which is the regular M1. Um, uh -huh. There's so many of them now. I, I Actually, I should have checked, but how many certifications do you have yourself? You probably have a ton of them. I have all the M1 and all the M2 except for order management. Okay. M2 order management. So I think was that be seven and M2. I cannot remember on M1. Was it five on M1? Okay. So I remember correctly. Maybe 12. 
Mm-hmm. Not bad. Not bad. Yeah. I ran across somebody with 11 mm-hmm. recently and I was like, that's a pretty, it's a pretty decent number. <laughs> it um, is. Yes. Yeah. And it takes uh, time. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it, it does. It's, it's a huge investment of time. And, mm-hmm. and, uh, I saw you, um, posted recently about, you know, answering questions related to the Magento certifications moving to Adobe. Um, what mm-hmm. are some of the questions you're seeing? Are people still confused? Uh, what are some things you're noticing there? Well, to be frank, that's been a good learning experience for me. Um, just it's been tough because, you know, Adobe's a massive organization and there's a lot of moving parts there and they definitely had some challenges getting everything in sync. And I think that's happened now. I think, I think everything is pretty good. Uh, in in that direction. However, um, I think some of the biggest challenge questions that we have been getting was we, me and and by well, obviously, we, how would I say this? Adobe and by extension, me, uh, since I'm kind of sl- slightly related, not any in any other way other than just that we You're write the king of material for this. You're the king well, of the okay, Magento whatever. certifications. <laughs> whatever. Okay. <laughs> sure. Um, but ultimately it's the big question is certification expiration. And I, I think people get the idea. Look, it's certification expiration. If I get certified in 2018 and now we're looking, so let's fast forward to 2022 and what M2, M2.6, M2.7, whatever it would be is out by then. Is that 2018 certification totally relevant? Um, the challenge was, though, when are these certification expirations going to take place? Um, and to be frank, I sent out an email that was slightly incorrect, and okay. I, uh, yeah, I was uh, pretty mad with myself about that. I had understood it differently than they had tried to communicate it. I immediately got that uh, cleaned up. Basically, the the official word is is that in 2021, sometime they will uh, evaluate when to expire the certification. So the certifications will not expire in 2021, but at some point after 2021 with plenty of notice, I mean, it could be two, three years after 2021. So it's, I think it's reasonable. Uh, It's, it's a pain to be frank. I mean, like for me, like I have seven, seven M uh, M2 certifications. I'm probably going to lose some number of those. I really don't feel like keeping up all seven all the time. Right. Um, just because of how much study and, and money ultimately will be involved there. So I think that's the biggest question that, yeah, that there has been, there's been some, um, and I think they've gotten this ironed out some challenges around getting voucher codes working, uh, examity and PSI and, um, scores by objective. But again, it's, it's a work in progress and, and I think they're handling it pretty decent. I mean, I, I wonder if another way to handle it is like, there's just new certifications. Like that's sort of how, mm-hmm. I guess that's sort of how it happened with M1 is that, um, I mean, you could have had an M1 cert for what, five, six, seven years, maybe. And then Long time, yes. they were sort of naturally deprecated as M2 came along. Um, mm-hmm. and there was just new certifications. So, I mean, that yes. could be one approach is like, if you, you know, if things are that different, uh, three years from now in 20 or one year from now, 2021 than they were in 2018 yes. like maybe they should just have a new certification by a different name mm-hmm. although that could get messy too you know one thing I, I think an extension of what you're saying there is uh putting uh date stamps on each one of the certifications so i'm professional professional developer certified 2020 um and so then the merchant can look at it or the agency hiring agency or wh- whatever is is doing the interaction there and we say okay i am uh you're you got certified in 2018 well that's you know we might are you, are you sure your skills are up to date uh, yeah. so the date stamp i think could also be could be part of that um, yeah. or the date stamp according to when the certification was updated you right. know so because the certifications are supposed to be updated every year two years yeah. somewhere in there so if it was state stamp based off the year of update, that yeah. would work. And it, 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 there's there's a lot of complexities there because then you have um, Delta exams, right? So you can say, okay, well, you know, bet- the changes between 2018 and 2021, yeah, we got MSI and uh, we have B2B and stuff stuff like that. So maybe we just test on some of these updates as opposed yeah. to everything, 
great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, I was going to say, I almost think that what will probably naturally happen is even if that 2018 cert is officially deprecated or it's officially mm -hmm. no longer valid, um, as I'm thinking through what the hiring process might look like, I'm imagining that, you know, you're an agency, you're hiring a developer, they right. uh, got the cert in 2018, they don't technically mm -hmm. have a cert, but they've worked at a, you know, the, their work history looks pretty solid, so you're going to go, nah, I sort of consider them certified for my purposes. Um, mm -hmm. that said, as I'm, as I'm thinking this through, um, if, if they apply it to the partner program, that's where there's going to be, be a real hard line on if you yes. need to get X number of certifications as a partner, um, mm -hmm. then it won't matter if they're unofficial. Um, that's so, right. Yeah. They'll have to figure that out. But then I guess this is going to be, you know, it's funny. This is, I think this might end up being another one of those things where the bigger companies get bigger. Be in the sense that the part, yes. like you talked about money's a factor, right? If you're an individual it's, and you got yes. eight certification, not, let's say you got, by then there's going to be 12 certifications <laughs> and you got to maintain all of those, right? Whereas as yes. a partner, it, it would make sense to pay for that as a partner. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe that's what ends up happening. You know, they. And exactly. And the bigger partners, yes, they have higher certification requirements, but at the same time, they're usually big enough. They easily float past that number. It's the, uh, yeah. and then they can have, they, I say backfill. I would, that's the term that first came to my mind. They can, they can bring on other people who don't have that high number of certifications. Maybe their certifications are outdated, whatever there's, there becomes more latitude, uh, versus if smaller agencies like us, uh, we have to work really hard to make sure that our people are up or grow or, or stay at a lower level than one would like to. So, um, I think, I think that's where, like you were saying, that some of the cha extra challenges come in uh, yeah. for those small and medium-sized partners. Yeah. I mean, it's part of sort of this dynamic of where we're moving up market in the Adobe ecosystem. Um, mm -hmm. Everybody's sort of moving up market and there's different ways in which that's affecting uh, people, different parts of the ecosystem. Um, yes. I noticed that you're also a big commerce partner. And I've been, mm -hmm. uh, it's, you know, where everybody is sort of becoming more multi-platform, uh, in, yes. in many different ways and trying to kind of navigate that, um, as the whole e-commerce world becomes more multi-platform. And yes. I'm curious, like how, what to you is the difference between the Magento ecosystem partnership program, Adobe partnership program, and like the big commerce one, for example. Mm -hmm. As far as that, from a partnership perspective, uh, I've been very impressed from a, and I'm talking from a really small partner. I'm in, in, in Adobe's eyes, you know, we're, we're, we are still really small. I like we're bronze uh, partners. So we've, we're just starting out. I hope to uh, continue to grow and all that. But um, and actually the cool thing is we just got our Magento specialization. So that's really, really stoking. Uh, we were really stoked about that. But on the big commerce is that side. a component I, to the Adobe partnership program, the Magento specialization? Yes. Yeah, so there's they have specializations for a whole bunch of different um, AEM and Marketo and Magento are the three that comes to my my mind the first uh, top, to the top of my head, uh, and I think they have a whole bunch else, but they have a lot of requirements like customer surveys and that sort of thing uh, in order to be able to get that. Um, but on the big commerce side, what really stood out to me was how you might almost say welcoming they are, uh, how excited they are to have a new. Uh, partner in the system. And, and I think that's something, again, no knocks at, at Adobe for this, but because uh, again, they're, they're a bit more upmarket than some of the smaller merchants like us are. And, but, but it seems to fit into where big commerce is at, even though I'm sure they are trying to move upmarket some, they really do still have a focus on those smaller merchants, those merchants, you know, running maybe up to 10 to 20 million a year is seems to be the big commerce sweet spot. And then mm -hmm. of course, again, they're trying to move up market there too. But when you have smaller merchants, I think you tend to have smaller agencies, which we would fit more into that sweet spot for big commerce as well. Right. So right. Um, that's, that's where I, that the feeling I got uh, in, in, in working with them, uh, very, very attentive um, help and assistance yeah, uh, through that. That makes sense. Process. It's kind of a, I mean, it's kind of a supply and demand thing, you know, like mm -hmm. as a platform, once you have enough partners to fulfill the needs that you have, 
you have yes. less of a need for those. And so for new partners mm -hmm. trying to come in, they're not as, let's say, friendly or welcoming because there just isn't the need. Whereas big commerce yes. is probably a little hungrier for um, that mm -hmm. type of a partner, um, yes. it seems. And, and so, uh, yeah, I'm trying to better. I mean, I've been so Magento focused for so long. I'm trying we to, all. yeah, <laughs> we all, uh, I'm yes. trying to better understand the Shopify ecosystem, big commerce, and then others like commerce tools, you know, there's so many of them. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's complicated when you have to understand other platforms and ecosystems and stuff like that. You and know? everyone has their own personality. Yeah. <laughs> um, does big commerce have certifications like developer certifications and stuff like that? They do certifications a little bit differently in that uh, you are uh, certified once you take their training course. So we've sent one of our guys through the training course, and it was excellent. Uh, it was gotcha. it was absolutely excellent. Um, they got a really good handle on a lot of different aspects of uh, big commerce and development, and so technically they are big commerce certified. But I like I couldn't, from my understanding, I can't go out and just get big commerce certified without going through their their boot camp. I think that's what it's called, a boot camp. Gotcha. Gotcha. That's cool. Mm -hmm. So in one of your posts related to Peter Manajax leaving, um, mm -hmm. I noticed that you said he often asked two questions. Is it congruent and do I care? Um, yes. and uh -huh. I was curious to kind of drill into that a little bit. Um, sure. and I've heard from so many people about how much he cared about everything that he was doing and how effective he was at getting people together, getting certifications done. Um, so I was curious, like what, what, how those kind of questions were used in the process. Yeah, definitely. Well, I, I, I just have to say, Peter is, has had a tremendous impact on me. And uh, I've, I really appreciated the time that I was able to spend with him, helped write two tests and then update, do a whole revision on all the rest of the Magento 2 tests. And it's, uh, he has a solid handle on writing tests. Um, I mean, think about it. You take, it's a room of smart people, 10 to 15 people uh, when in these test writing sessions and they're all smart people, but he comes in as the test writing expert and he educates everybody else how to do this. So it's, and, and it's not just a matter of writing an essay or something along those lines. I mean, that can be complex in itself, but it's, it, the idea is taking this Magento material as, as identified in the blueprint, which is really the study guide on the Adobe website, Adobe certification website taking that, that there, and there's some extra information in there and saying, okay, I got to go write a question on this. And so when I go try to figure out a, and it's not just a question like uh, that would be memorization based. W what, what is the menu item name here uh, that will do this task, right? It's a scenario. Okay. A merchant using Magento commerce uh, is running into this problem. How would you solve this or how, 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 how is it solved or what are the ramifications of taking this different action? So you have to figure out a, a scenario and that's where real life experience makes a huge difference. Uh, you know, yeah, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. But um, ultimately, once we get this question written, then we do go through a time of review. And that's, that's the most fun part of the, of the whole process because everybody's, I mean, again, you're sitting in a room of smart people, like, uh, like really smart people. I felt, I always felt, uh, uh, like the, like the, one of the, the dim bulb and I felt like the dim bulb in the room, uh, simply because I mean, just brilliant people. So I they're mean, all, they're in discussing the right room. <laughs> it. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's the good room to be. And I agree. Uh, so in discussing it, uh, that those were a couple of the questions that were asked. Um, is it congruent? You meaning, does this make sense with the objective that we're testing? So if, if the objective is, about, um, say, I'm a business practitioner, if it's about um, Magento architecture, but the question is about uh, inventory, you know, it's not going to, it's not congruent with the objective because ultimately those objectives, uh, I think it's five on the business practitioner, those need to be, each one of those objectives needs to accurately assess the candidate's capabilities of that objective, you know, so if they get a 60% on one of those, they need to know that it was truly that objective, as opposed to stuff scattered all across the board. Mm -hmm. So that's where the is it congruent? Does it matter? Uh, and, and this eliminated a lot of questions. Uh, it was because another way to say it is, do I really care? Um, does do I care that this feature exists? Do I care that this piece of code is in the system? Um, is this something that could have real life 
implications or consequences? Um, or is it, for example, is it like when I took the Zen certified engineer, I think that was PHP 5.1, which it seems like a while back uh, was is for a, yeah, a museum. <laughs> there was, there were so many things on there that didn't matter. It's like, I've never used this. I have never touched this. Why in the world would I care about this? It was ridiculous. And, and that's what Peter was trying to avoid. There's, it, there's still, don't get me wrong. There's still tough questions. It's just to the best of our capability, those, those questions mattered. They were, and they also aligned with the objectives that we were trying to work with. Right. Right. You must have thought between your, your test prep stuff, uh, study guides and the, the actual certification stuff you've done, you must have thought a lot about how to write a good question. Uh, and I'm curious, yes. like, like, like how, I mean, you've touched a little bit on that with those two specific kind of components, but, um, mm -hmm. and this also must factor into like other aspects of your, your work life and business. Like when you're hiring somebody, um, or maybe even when you're doing discovery with a client, like, have you thought a lot about how to phrase and how to frame questions? Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's made a massive difference in my, I hope my speaking vocabulary, although I don't know, I still feel like English is a second language to me and I don't have any first language. Um, <laughs> I, but I, but it has in, in a lot of it, it was funny a while ago I had, we worked with a merchant who was very, very particular with the use of uh, with the use of the English language, and they taught me a lot, and that was it was really good. Uh, and, and Peter really, I would say, has continued that. Um, you know, I, I had written a lot of practice test questions and really a lot of questions on the Magento test, but he he was still so good to work with me and to uh, to help me understand how to make them more how to make them better. Things that just don't matter in the sentence. Uh, for example, he said you can almost always get rid of the word that. And as I, as I write, I still catch myself using the word that, and is it really necessary? There's a few times it's necessary, but many times it cleans up the sentence by leaving it out. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, getting rid of superfluous stuff, things that it, especially on the fo question, we're focusing on one objective. This is all that matters. And so some of these other details really don't matter. They don't really help with the answer. They don't help with the question. Uh, and so being okay with getting rid of that. So yes, absolutely. It's helped. And, and mostly in the form of being succinct. Yeah. Have you, um, there's this software called Descript or Descript, uh, which mm -hmm. is really neat for video and audio editing. And, um, okay. it's making me think of this because there's a feature where you can drag your audio or your video in, it pulls out right. the, um, the, uh, all the words, and then you can edit the video by just editing the words and then it okay. also has um, a way to automatically remove all the filler words, like the likes and the um. Nice. And yes. I'm basically waiting for yeah, I'm I'm waiting for like a real time version of that. <laughs> so I can just <laughs> plug into my mic, you know. Yeah. Um, for sure. It's funny. Yeah, I was joking with a buddy who um, listens to podcasts on like two x. You know how a lot of people do that, one point five x or two yes, x. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I've tried to do that, but I just can't do it because I don't know. I like to hear sort of conversational spoken, you right. know, language um, right. when it's when it's too like if I'm listening to an audio book and mm -hmm. it has that economy of words, it, it's removed all the filler. It's 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 more yes. efficient and focused, but it's like I can't mm -hmm. quite get into it because it's it's not. I don't know. There's something about the filler words, the conversational stuff that makes it for me a little easier to listen to. That's, that's a different yes. time. I mean, that's, that's like podcasts, but it's, uh, yeah, well, l language is an interesting thing. It is. Um, it is. And you definitely have a lot of experience with podcasts. I've done a couple of them in my day. Yes. Um, so it's I was really talking love the talk ones. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Um, I was talking with Laura uh, Falco recently, and she mm -hmm. was saying that she had heard that some of these – she was hearing from people that the Swift Otter tests, test questions were like harder than the actual certification tests, uh, mm -hmm. which I thought was, was interesting. I'm curious if you have any thoughts on that. If in some way it sort of should be that way, like if you're mm -hmm. getting ready for something, you want to get ready in a way that's harder than the actual thing. And then on the other yes. hand, like, even if it was harder, how do, how would you measure that? It's a very subjective thing to measure, you know? 
Mm -hmm. Yes. I work to, well, the reason I have purposely worked to make the questions harder is I want to have some wiggle room because ultimately if somebody goes take, takes my tests and most of the Magento, all of the Magento 2 tests, their passing scores in the 60s. And if somebody takes my test, gets a 80% and then goes, takes the Magento test and gets a 60, I am not happy uh, with myself, not with them, with myself, because ultimately it was a poor uh, predictor of their success. And that's Do you hear I, back that's from people a lot? Where, or did you in the past where they did that, they got the 80 and mm -hmm. then they took the test and they got the 60 and there you're was, like, dang it. There was, a, there was definitely a few of them on the professional, well, it was professional, now expert developer uh, test. That was, that was the one I've, I, have, I had struggled with uh, for probably the good first six months to a year. Some people just, it, it was spot on. Some people, it was really good. I guess I would say there was a high range of variability on that one. Uh, is some people just really struggled and I really fought through. It was like, why, why is this? How can I, how can I improve it? People, a lot of people kept asking for more questions and I, I kept adding more questions. I think that test is up to like 180 practice questions. It's insane. Okay. And I've uh, had the pleasure of working with some uh, other people on building out questions on there too. And again, that was for the first year. And since then it's, I think it's been really, really good. I work to track every single score I possibly can. Uh, if, if somebody has taken a practice test, I want their real score too. Um, because I okay. actually built a, a whole machine learning algorithm to try to as really to take those scores to associate them with the well their their certification score associate with the practice test score. And then I use that, well, if nothing else, I have an Excel spreadsheet, well, Google Sheets, that I have that I can look through and I can spot trends over time. And then but I also loaded that in there built a whole machine learning algorithm. I loved that. It's like, how man, did I wish you I had more time to, how did you build a machine learning algorithm? I built it in, well, I shouldn't do it, but I, I, I shouldn't have done it in PHP, but I did it in PHP. That was my favorite language. Um, I just worked through tutorials online. It's, it's honest. It's a fairly basic problem to solve. Okay. Uh, there's still a lot further that we can go with that, but again, it's all, all a matter of time. Um, but yeah, it's just, so I, I use those to help me, help predict. And, and it's pretty accurate at this point. Um, then the next, the next challenge actually in that whole process was I found that people were taking the practice test. It just believe me when I say this 50 to hundred times, there were some people, not wow. everybody. Uh, and, and then they were getting hundred percent. And when you get a hundred percent, well, right, you're ready to take the test. That, that's, that means you're ready. No. And then they'd go and get say 40% on the real test. So what I've had, what I had to do there is work through, okay, so how do I help people through that process? And that's, was, that's been a big focus of the YouTube ed, uh, video education is, okay, folks, just because I don't care what practice test it is, whether you're studying for your ham radio license or, or for a Magento <laughs> test, you take a practice test a bazillion times, you're not going to, it's not going, and you memorize all the answers. Right. If the test, if the practice test is legit, i.e. not a carbon copy of the real test, Right. You're, it's not going to help you study. What right. you need to do in study is work through these objectives. You know, I've, I've put out the three courses now for the, for Magento test. You have to work through these objectives, uh, a point by point. You have to especially figure out where are your weak areas, you know, and, and temptation is to just gloss over our weak areas. Right. And it's just like, oh, I don't want to study memorize that. No. questions and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, exactly. So I've actually made it more difficult in the whole practice test in, uh, software to get your answers. Uh, the, the answers you have to now click to see every single one. It's a bit of a pain, but if you're ready to go take the test, it's, you have access to it. But otherwise, if you're just going to go memorize it, answers 50 or 100 times, it, it's, it's going to be too much work. So then does it, instead of giving you all the individual answers, do you tell them which er general areas to focus on once they take a test? <laughs> We have been adding that in at first. I was not, uh, some of our later revisions, I believe do include that. I think, um, the, it was, we're writing the test. We put that on there. I can't remember actually if we got that into this engine, I have to double check or into right. the database. Uh, but yes, that's, that is part of the goal. Um, every objective is shown on there. So down to the sub objective. Okay. Um, it's not just like, um, architecture, like I was talking about in business practitioner earlier, it's, there's all the individual points. So you can see broken out by sub point. Okay. This is where you need to go study a little bit more. Nice. That's really yes. cool. Um, mm -hmm. 
how are things going with the uh, with the business in general with with the the test guide business in general? I remember seeing when you started to monetize it, which I thought was really smart because, like I like you said at first, it was free, um, and you've yeah. obviously got a lot going on. You got the agency and everything, um, but yeah. but how are things going with the with the study guide business? I would say it's good. Um, it's it, it, it's funny. It, it has its ups and downs. Uh, right when COVID hit, it slowed down. Um, but it's, it's, uh, definitely picked back up again. Um, and what I've been really excited about is those courses that I've been building out. So obviously there's the practice test, there's a study guide and then for a, well, okay. I got to remember the right terms now. So the professional and the expert developer test, I can't keep track of it. it. I, I can't keep yeah. track of the new Adobe certification names. It's impossible. Like, they're well, just associate got a, got an upgrade, professional got an upgrade, but uh, yeah, it's it's not easy to remember. <laughs> it's not. It's yeah. tough. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Uh, but, but anyways, I and it, the sort of the, the the courses have been really cool because uh, I've in it's working through a very unique methodology. Um, and and that was actually the cool thing is for a while um, the professional developer previously associate developer course was free, and it was kind of a new way of doing things. And I didn't really want to charge for it until I was hundred percent certain this was going to be effective. Right. Um, because ultimately in my case, I, uh, with writing material like this, I have a, I, I have a, uh, a good metric as far as whether I'm being successful or not. Right. People pass the test. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, a lot of other courses out there, it, it's difficult to have a, uh, set, well set metrics. Right. I mean, right. so, Okay, we learned something out of it. That's great. But in this case, certifications, uh, you either have a pass or fail at the end of it. I mean, or somebody right. doesn't take a test, but uh, right. that's where it's really good and motivational. You got to keep you got to keep on this stuff. You have to um, continue to be upgrading and improving the course to make sure that it's helping people pass. Yeah. Where do you see yourself going from here with the certification prep? Are you going to tackle different types of certifications, branch out a little bit? um, focus more on that machine learning algorithm, um, or different ways to get results. Like where do you, what are some of the areas you see yourself focusing on? Um, my goal is, is branching out, branching out in general, uh, more general training, uh, as far as, and not even for Magento, uh, it will start with Magento because that's what I'm personally very familiar with. But my goal is to, uh, just putting this out there is to develop soft skills at this point. Um, that that's what I'm working towards because I think soft skills are incredibly valuable um, when hiring, uh, whether it's debugging, whether it's, uh, sorry, in other words, troubleshooting, um, whether it's architecture, that sort of thing. And all of that fits around Magento um, and maybe other platforms as well. But um, that's, I'm actually working on a course, uh, first time I talked about this, but um, I call it the art of debugging. And nice. it's going to be specifically in relation to Magento. And uh, there's been times where I've worked with other developers on project, and I'm not tooting my horn here at all, but I've I've worked through the some of these processes and uh, been able to solve problems really fast. And so my goal is to work through a build out a framework whereby uh, I can help other people become excellent at troubleshooting, fast at troubleshooting. So it definitely nice. combines a knowledge of the platform. But there's a whole bunch of other information, other ideas that come together in order to make one excellent, very fast at troubleshooting. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a huge difference. Like somebody could be stuck on something for a day or two days mm -hmm. because they're not able to kind of get themselves unstuck. And for somebody else, yes. it can be they pop into X debug, they figure it out in 20 minutes, mm -hmm. and then they're rolling. It can be such a huge difference um, yes. in, in kind of capabilities there. Um, for sure. We had a, a great, a great example. If I could say this real quick, um, there was, we were, we ended up being a little too expensive for a merchant. They wanted to find some a little cheaper, which was fine. Um, but so we were, they had the other, this other agency had pretty well taken over. Um, and I think it was a Magento going to Magento 2.3, uh, well, no, 2.3.4. And, um, they, they, they did the release, all that stuff and the site went down. They were getting a weird infinite loop error in the checkout um the poor people they the poor developers they spent i don't know the site was down and it's, it's there's some pretty significant amount of transactions going through the site um, i guess they tested on staging or whatever it was down for hours and hours they reached out to me and uh and turns out it was a 
problem that was causing the, the uh, checkout session to load in an infinite loop. Um, just check because out of session support. issues. Oh. <laughs> that was going to be oh, yeah. brutal. <laughs> it, it was, it was, but you know, the, the problem was solved and I think it was 30 minutes or less. So, um, and just trying to get in there and work out and it, it, work it out. And that's what really got started me thinking. It's like, wait, how can I help people learn the basic steps of troubleshooting? Uh, and, and there's, there is a framework uh, that, that goes with that. Um, and I, it will make them more valuable in their jobs and, be able to solve problems faster. I, my takeaway from that would have just been, I told you so. I'd have just been, I'd, have, I'd have just been giving them, giving yeah. them, I told you so pretty heavy at that point. Yep. Well, it was actually very funny about that. It was then later they, uh, this other agency came back and was talking about how um, we caused the problem in the first place. And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. No. We, did not do, we did not do the upgrade. <laughs> I had communicated back then, but I hadn't CC'd enough people. Let's just put it that way. So yeah, I'm yeah. always learning. I'm always learning. Agency wars. Yeah, it's tough. Um, yeah, it is. The, so the Actionable Insights podcast um, yes. is is super interesting. Um, how's that? How's that going for you? What's the what's the focus there on that podcast? Yeah, the, the goal there is. It, it's funny. It's kind of wrapped up in the name Actionable Insights. Uh, I was gonna say it kind of like it's very self explanatory, like the name. Yeah, it's a bit of a dumb question. Yeah. <laughs> Well, no, 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 not at all. Because, you know, and I think that's actually one problem with the name is that it's too obvious. Um, you know, it doesn't like, like mage talk. You I mean, I mean you, you can quickly determine what that is about or future commerce or um, how I built this. But actionable insights is actually a little, and, and all of those have, I think, a slight degree of obscurity. Actionable insights is, is a little bit too obvious, I think. Um, thus, it warrants the question. Um, my goal with that is, is interviews with other merchants. Um, to this point, I have not interviewed, I think, um, a, a, a service provider or anything like that. To interview merchants Smart. talking about their journey in selling online, uh, their wins, their losses, and to get to boil it down to a converse in a conversational format to what a merchant can do, uh, implement on their website tomorrow or the, in the next uh, week or whenever the timetable is. And, and as part of that, uh, I also built out really detailed show notes. I mean, like really, really detailed I show notes. a couple of them, yeah. Yeah, and the goal is that, okay, if you don't listen to it, you can read it, read, read it get in reading format. Um, still same great content. To be frank, I've uh, been focusing on some other marketing endeavors and uh, I haven't had as much time to invest in that again lately, but I'm looking forward um, to getting back into it because that was... I don't know if anybody listening to it, frankly, I think people were, and uh, it's, you know, as you know, with podcasts, it's kind of hard to get those actual measurements out of it, yeah. but I, I learned so much out of it and um, I definitely got good feedback. So it's not like nobody listened to it. Um, there were definitely people that did, but it's like, man, I, I learned so much through it. And that was, I felt I like think, I gained all the value out of it. Dude. I think that's the key with stuff like this is, is when yeah. you are, learning yourself and enjoying the process if it's mm -hmm. just a if it's just a marketing tactic um putting out the content right. i mean that can work but i i really think it's so much better um when it's mm -hmm. something where you're really interested in and in learning uh throughout the process yeah. and i i didn't realize it was it was focused on just merchants because that's actually yeah. something i've told so many people i'm like there's no podcast where you're just interviewing merchants, maybe even e-com directors specifically, I think would be a really interesting mm -hmm. niche. Um, Which is my goal, yes. Mm -hmm. I love it. That's really smart because for some reason, all of the podcasts, like you said, it's service providers, it's vendors in the industry. For some reason, that's what it ends up being. Mm -hmm. And there's very few podcasts that focus on the merchants themselves. Um, yes. I sometimes wonder if they're sort of less interested in being transparent in general yes. as like a general yes. stereotype as compared mm -hmm. to let's say an agency um right because when an agency shares x y and z it's kind of marketing for them it's lead generation mm -hmm. for them when a merchant That's shares right. i got this conversion rate by doing this maybe they're thinking their competitors are going to do the same thing yes and i think that's that that has well that's been definitely a challenge like getting getting merchants on and there's some people who've um oh i'm gonna forget their name um ian leslie from industry west 
brilliant, brilliant person. And he's shared a lot. Like, I mean, you've, if you read some of his articles, uh, absolutely outstanding. And some of the stuff that he shared, like, especially as we entered into COVID came out of COVID, I say came out of it. I don't know if we've ever exited it, but you know, I mean, came out of that initial worst part of it. Uh, incredible stuff. And he was, I mean, just a phenomenal podcast, um, phenomenal episode there. And so, yes. And I think that's can be a challenge, like sharing the secret sauce and, um, so deciphering, okay, what is secret sauce? Because ultimately a lot of what we're talking about is very well known. It's, it's not like, um, talking about the code to build this proprietary uh, configurator or something like that. It's not like nuclear it's, secrets. It's like, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, but I also understand it's like, if, if I was a merchant, why would I want to share too much other information outside as well? So um, I, I've, I've been so grateful for the people who have been willing to come on and, and there's stuff we steer away from talking about from talking about, but there's still a lot that each one of these merchants that has come on and, uh, is willing to share, talk about, and uh, incredibly educational, um, incredible insights as to how they how they get this stuff done. I mean, it's it's a fight. It's a fight every day for one, every one of them. I mean, I'm sure there's a couple that have their their audience just handed to them, but it's a otherwise for ninety plus percent, it's a fight. Yeah, uh, and just clawing their way to the top, and that's. I love to learn about that. Yeah, it's interesting. My gut feeling is that like the most um a lot of the most successful merchants or almost every business are the ones that are transparent about mm -hmm. what's going on. And I don't know if that's exactly true that may be my own kind of bias, but I feel like for some reason if they would be more transparent, it would it would somehow mm -hmm. help their businesses, maybe not directly, cuz they're not if they sell furniture, they're not going to get customers coming to buy furniture after being on your right. podcast but it can help with recruiting it can help with a lot of things so i feel like yes. there's a huge benefit to to everybody for for them to put that stuff out mm -hmm. there um yes. so i think that's really smart i noticed last question i noticed on your okay. website that um you're uh focusing on outdoors um <laughs> uh, outdoor sports i noticed that was kind of your headline was that was your yes. the, the the type of merchant that you serve um, mm -hmm. and I thought that was cool. I, like, I love niches of all kinds. Like I love it when yes. people have a specific thing that they do. So when did you start focusing there? We've been focusing on that for honestly a m couple months. So it's just in its infancy. Um, pre before that I've been, I'd been really working on Kansas city and to be frank, there's not that many merchants in Kansas city, uh, mm -hmm. for, for whatever reason, especially that are using, well, there's a num good number, but not all of them are using Magento. So, um, it, we have a, a good number of merchants in Kansas city that we're working with. And so I was working with a, uh, I don't know what you want to call it. A, someone who, who does marketing, but they're not doing the marketing for us. So, uh, not a counselor, marketing counselor, advisor, maybe marketing advisor. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that was, that was their suggestion. And, and we on, we, we love the outdoors. Um, we love all that stuff ourselves. And just the goal is to, uh, to be authentic ourselves, right? I mean, because if we, as we can be authentic, as we can, um, and then also then center into a specific niche, and we can provide more value. And obviously the big question I had to work through is like, well, but what if you're taking on competitors? The reality is inside right. of this outdoor sports and hunting, et cetera, there's a ton of different niches. There's really? a ton of them. And um, while I would never want to, I say never. I, I can't imagine taking two competitors without at least having a conversation with the competitor that we were, were, were originally working with um, to get their approval. And I've done that on a number of occasions with my current clients. Um, the, it, the, the, there's, it, there are a ton of niches and um, that sub niches, if you want to look at it right, that way. Right. And, and so that's, I, I got, I, once I got through that, I was like, yeah, we're going to do that. It's that's cool. Uh, we're not, I'm not going to turn away people that I don't know, sell jewelry or something like that. Right. Um, but right. it's, it's, it's where we want it, where we are focusing and where we're seeking to do more of our marketing. Yeah. Smart. It gives you uh, immediate differentiation and allows mm -hmm. you to focus on the types of functionality that they would need that others might not yes. and things like that. So I love it. Absolutely. Well, Joseph, this has been a lot of fun. 
uh yeah. thanks for the chat and where's the best thanks place for, for people to find you online uh linkedin or twitter so uh okay. that's you can find me pretty well there uh it should be easy to find hopefully Thank <laughs> you.